All right, so um, thanks uh, for joining us for this uh, final session. We, it's sort of a bit of an opportunity to debrief. By the way, does anybody want to review that inclusivity statement from before? But uh, do you want to spend a little bit of time now thinking about the conference? What did we do? What did we talk about? We have a bit of a goal on what we intended to do here. It's an opportunity for us to think about did we get it? Did we hit that mark? And what would we have to do in order to do a better job of trying to hit that mark? So I'll just share a few thoughts on my initial interest with this event and what we wanted to do with it. And then I've asked each of the panelists to take about five to eight minutes to just say things to. And uh, then we're going to move to questions from the floor. And I really want you to reflect on your experience here. And I, and I don't want like a happy yay or a you suck kind of reflection. I want something that allows us to move forward in a meaningful way with the conversations that have been had over the last few days as a backdrop for our subsequent actions. So initially, one of the views I've had for a while is that A, educators have a lot more passion than they have money. <laughs> and secondly, they also have a lot more passion than they have power and influence. There's a hell of a lot going on in all sectors of the education landscape, whether it's K to 12 or whatever, whatever. There's a lot of activity. And one of those areas of activity is uh, obviously uh, higher education and the way that things are changing. And you've all heard the narrative, right? Universities are going to uh, die. There's going to be, it's being unbundled. There's a lot of startups doing stuff here. Universities are outsourcing core capabilities such as teaching and learning and design. And the list goes on. I mean, we can run through a list of change buzzwords that we've all heard and that we've read in prominent publications. So my thinking and our thinking as a team initially was, what can we contribute to that climate of change that allows us to have a seat at the table of power? And the only thing that I at least think we can contribute at that space is research. Because it's the only lever that we can provide that is true, Dave. That is completely true. The only thing... <laughs> yeah. I swear I'm going to signal back at you in a minute. Children, you're going to have to turn your eyes away on this one. Uh, anyway, so the only thing that we really have, if we want to make substantive influence, is we need to be able to go out and take the ideas that happen in our labs and take the concepts that we're experimenting with and put a research lens on it. I'm very cautious about rhetoric. We all know what needs to happen in education. If you have something that looks a little bit like a soul, you know that there's issues with adjuncts. You know that we're not giving access to the best and the brightest students in our society. We know that we're pushing out a lot of the change potential that we need because we have inefficient structured systems of education. And the list goes on. We're aware of a lot of these challenges. But the difficulties that we have then is saying, well, we can sit there and tell one another what sucks about higher education and what's wrong. Or we can start moving toward a solutions mindset that is based in research. And that was our initial intent with this conference. I'm not 100% sure that we hit that, but I want to tease this out over, our con uh, over the balance of the conversation that we're going to be having now. So with that as a starting point, um, why don't I pass it over to Mike and just ask you to reflect, what did you get out of this conference? What would you have liked to have done differently? Um, anything like that. So I, I actually sat right here and I told George this because I thought we would be going the other way and I get the talk. <laughs> uh, get, get the talk last instead of first and get the uh, kind of um, pull, my, uh, pull my thoughts together. Um, you know, it, it strikes me that you know, this is kind of an interesting um, post-post-apocalyptic time, and um, I and you kind of see that in the conversations that we're having, right? So, you know, it was going to be the apocalypse, uh, or it was going to be the utopia. I mean, there were these sort of utopian dreams here and these apocalyptic dreams, and neither one of them seems to have happened, and so we're all kind of left waiting on that hilltop. Um, trying to figure out what to do next, or, or maybe not waiting. I think, I think most of us understood uh, that it was neither one of those things, but, but the, the, the cultural context was such that we, we had to talk in those terms. Um, and so, and so now, we're, now, we're, now we're at an interesting moment, and, and George asked us to, to, since we're also discussing collaboration, to, to talk about collaboration. 
uh, in ethics and collaboration. And uh, you know, collaboration is, is one of the examples that's really pertinent here because you know, what I find us doing is continually going back to uh, you know, um, you know, examples that are often you know, six, seven, eight years old and, and, and talking about these um, as, as the sort of models or proof that we, we are absolutely right. Um, you know, we, around 2004, 2006, we started hauling out Wikipedia as a collaborative uh, context. Um, and I think at the time, uh, there was an idea that there, was there were going to be more, many more examples like Wikipedia. And I think if you had asked me, I'm not a utopian, but if you had asked me in 2006, are there going to be many, many things like Wikipedia in, in six years, seven years? I wouldn't say, I'd say it wouldn't take six or seven years, in four years is going to be many. And of course, uh, we, we pretty much, I mean, we pretty much have, I don't mean to minimize things, but there's nothing on the scale of Wikipedia that's happened since, you know, just once, you know. Um, and I feel like so many of our examples are like that. And, and so we're at this moment and, um, you know, part of us wants to be uh, very, you know, rhetorical and very focused on spin and trying to, you know, we spent so much time getting people to believe us. Um, and we want to preserve that and move forward with that. Uh, and then the other part of us has to simultaneously be looking at this stuff critically and saying, well, you know, is there something wrong with our model here that this is not coming together uh, you know, quite the way uh, we imagined, you know, in, in, in those, t the, the, the stress, you know, I was talking with uh, uh, Roland about this uh, just uh, m moments ago, the stress between those two, I, I find to be part of my daily existence, you know, that, that on the one hand, you're trying to get people to buy in, so we have, we have the, the money and the, the um, you know, the, the mind space and, and, and the, the, the cultural capital to, get to try these ideas for real, <laughs> you know, on a scale that, you know, people in this area get to try all the time, and we don't. We don't get to build the prototype to prove that we're right. Um, at the other time, you know, at the same time, we, we, we really have to be self-critical, which moves against uh, us having that sort of believable, reductive passion that you seem the need to, to get, you know, a Series A. So, so there, there's, there's a... There's a um, there's this, there's this, there's this uh, tension between those two. And, and I, I would say the thing that I saw most, in, through, at least through my lens, at this conference is, 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 is there, there, there is this tension. You saw it in, in uh, some of the conversations after uh, the, the last keynote. I saw it in the last uh, session um, uh, that I was in. Um, in numerous pieces of that session, um, you know, how do we maintain our integrity and maintain our, the critical lens on what we do while at the same time, uh, you know, be the activists that we need to be to get the space to, to, to really try to do it. And, and uh, you know, I don't know. And I, I don't know that this conference has solved that for me, but I, I get the sense I'm not alone in it. So maybe that's, that, that's probably something really valuable. Barbara, what's your reflections? Well, I... I thought uh, when I started out that what I was going to talk about was um, a theme I saw in sessions of getting beyond the dichotomies, the either or, uh, and uh, that's kind of where I was yesterday. But I think everybody experienced a different conference depending on what sessions you go to and your perspective. I, I come at it from a researcher's perspective and I'm used to going to more strictly research conferences. So I was really struck by how many categorizations I heard that things were, these are traditional slash elite students versus non-traditional students. These are experts versus, you know, the whole room. This is digital media producers versus consumers, pragmatic versus political, um, formal versus open learning. And I, I think I was most attracted to those sessions that tried to see a more complex ecology and get beyond the two categories. So, for example, um, yesterday somebody talked about it's no longer a question of whether it's online versus face-to-face, in-person learning, that we need to get rid of that question. And I, and I totally agree with that, say, being someone who spent about two years of my life doing a meta-analysis of all the research <laughs> comparing online and face-to-face -face learning that met any standard of rigorous design. 
Um, I think now the issue is not which is better or what kind of students do we serve or what do you go to higher education for. There are lots of purposes, there are lots of kinds of learners, different learners have different purposes at different times. The systems issue is really how can we have a higher education system that delivers better value to students of all these types that gets more positive outcomes reliably for diverse sets of student populations. And um, I think uh, it can be a process of self-discovery for some students or some learners. It doesn't have to be formal. But for some people, it's very pragmatic. They just need a certain set of skills or they just need a credential that can get them the next step in the workplace um, performance ladder. And I, you know, uh, higher education will not continue to exist and get public funding in the United States if we don't solve that problem. And it doesn't matter whether you're a faculty member, a graduate assistant, or an adjunct. The whole system is going to fall apart if we can't show that we have better value for them. So I think that, um, you know, as a researcher, I agree with George that part of what we need to do is uh, really help think about how we can articulate and, and measure that value. And I think it's not just going to be one measure. Um, it's going to be multiple measures and got to be sensitive to, um, sensitive to context. Um, one of the things we've seen in our own uh, work uh, is that um, there's also this dichotomy between the researcher and the researchee. And traditionally it's been researchers uh, come up with a research question, they come up with funding, uh, they come up with a design, and then they go to a college or students, you know, come be the subject of my study, and I'm the one who owns the study. And then, I know in education research anyway, we're kind of surprised that a lot of our research doesn't get taken up and have any impact on the education system. Why does that happen? And so one of the things that a number of us in the education research community have articulated recently is, you know, maybe the problem is we shouldn't own the research. We shouldn't own the topic of what it's about. So we've articulated what we call design-based implementation research. And the idea here is that the researcher and the organization that you're working with, the education institution, actually meet together and discern what the problem is, the problem of practice that you want to have researched, and what it would mean to get better on that problem of practice and working on it together. And I think once you start working in that way, it's not a matter of monitoring somebody or, or coming and finding somebody to be the subject so you can get another journal article. Your goal is actually improvement, and you'll know whether you've done better if you can or not. So I think that's another, in my personal work, for me, that's the dichotomy that I'm trying to overcome, is the dichotomy between the researcher and the researchees. We really need to be partners in improvement in particular settings and for particular problems. So that's what I'd like to see future conferences work on. Great. Thanks, Barb. Next. Um, Hi everyone, I'm George Villachanos, and I guess I'm a researcher too. I, someone was talking about yesterday about, you know, what's your identity and does your identity change depending on which context you're in. And, <laughs> you know, if you're to ask me, I'd say, yeah, I'm a researcher. Uh, so, you know, I guess keep that in mind as I'm going through these themes that I came up with because I'm a qualitative researcher. Um, but, you know, when I came to the conference, I guess I wasn't expecting any answers to some of these questions that I had, then in that respect, you know, the conference did for me what I was expecting. I don't have answers to take back, but, but I think that's a good thing, right? I have more questions about um, some of the issues that I'm thinking about in my own practice. I have more questions about my institution, about, you know, the general um, scholarly work that we do in this, in this respect. So um, I see that as a positive. One, I guess one thing that consistently it kept coming up for me was just this idea of seeking alternative voices when we're doing our work um, and and collaborating with students in our in our research in our work which Barbara just uh, uh, was mentioning um, and listening to the students and trying to figure out how we can help 
share their story, not necessarily to tell the story for them, but maybe amplify their voice or, uh, you know, share that story in context that they're not able to find themselves in. So, you know, when you're invited in a board of governors meeting, right, and, uh, and students are invited or asking for students to be invited and so on. Um, I think closely related to that is something else that I've been thinking about that a lot of people in this room have helped me think about uh, in recent months, and that's the, the idea of caring for our students and for, uh, for their life and for seeing them as people. And that was very, that was evident for me in one of the prior panels where um, uh, a doctoral student was sitting up here talking about students with disabilities, and I can't remember her name, but, oh. Jahan. Yeah. So, um, you know, we talk about, we talk about students, right, but we don't necessarily talk about people who are students, right, in the same way that we talk about people who have a disability. Like, you wouldn't call uh, someone a disabled person, right, you would call them a person who is disabled or has a particular disability, right? So, I think seeing our students with the same lens as people who have you know, all of these other things that are happening in their life, but they also happen to be a student and trying to figure out how we can uh, redesign our learning environment to accommodate for that life is, is important. Um, and I think with that comes this idea of cultivating a compassion for, for the people that we work with, whether those are uh, our students or colleagues that, uh, that we, you know, research with and, and whatnot. Um, I think all of this is uh, encompassed in um, in what I saw as a um, as a desire to resist reductionist agendas in education, uh, whether c that comes in you know particular methodological approaches that reduce students to numbers, or or whether it comes uh, you know in the form of a per particular design that says this is what you have to do to you know do effective uh, online ed. Um, but I also think that we need to be careful of, you know, the alternative, right, to to avoid creating power structures that, uh, you know, create uh, different problems when we're creating new designs. Um, you know, in, in promoting networks, for example, what alternative power structures might arise that might, you know, put other people at a disadvantage. So I think, you know, if you would take all of that together and jumble it together, I think, the student is in the middle, right, and, and uh, trying to figure out how we can uh, help create a better um, learning environment or future for them is, is what I saw here, and I'm happy that I saw that. All right, great, thanks. So uh, what we're going to try to do now is get a few questions and comments out from folks on the floor in terms of your experiences. It's pretty wide-ranging. Uh, we want to sort of hear what you might want us to do differently if we had to go back and rethink and redo this conference. Uh, by the same account, though, I'd, I'd love to hear while folks are getting questions raised, and I'd like to just, and questions typically would be nice if it was slightly less than a monologue, and if it was a question uh, to direct to the panel uh, so that we can sort of tease out it. And I'd like to move quickly through a range of ideas so that we don't spend 15 minutes on one idea and not necessarily, but I just want to touch on a number of them. So while people have got their hands in there, I'd like to direct a question to, to the panelists here. What were the foundational assumptions that you felt in this event that were incorrect? <laughs> Can I take that? Um, I'll, okay, I think it was I'll, Dave, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll say, um, I'm, uh, and I, I'm not sure how I would have done it differently. So it's always, it's always easier to be the Monday morning quarterback, or is it Tuesday morning? I'm not sure. But anyway, whichever. Um, but I think if we wanted to make sense, we wanted to make sense out of higher education and how research might contribute to improving it. And then we tried to have some threads that sort of would run together. And, but it, it seems to me that it, we didn't have a sort of conceptual framework of how those three threads necessarily would build up to making sense out of higher education. So how did they fit together? And so it, it seemed to me like we had, you know, three, we had one overarching question and we had three pillars, but the pillars didn't really hold up a pediment that would be higher education. They 
seemed like they were pillars out in the field, and then the higher education conundrum was kind of over here. So that, to me, was the one thing I think we could have done okay. better, is really trying to articulate the relationship between the, the strands and the ultimate goal. Um, I was talking with Kate Bowles uh, on this the other day as we were walking back, and uh, I think a lot of the conversation has been U.S.-centric. So when we're talking about higher ed, you know, what higher ed are we talking about? And uh, I mean, it became very evident in different conversations. For example, um, you know, when I was hearing about the community college system in California, you know, b consisting of 110 plus institutions, right? And Canada has over 80 public institutions overall. So, you know, there's there's differences there, right? And you know, I'm a small mostly online institution in Canada right now, you know, uh, catering towards professional adults. And when I was at UT Austin, our audience was much different, right? So those, um, I think those, differ those differences are significant in articulating um, and recognizing. And I'm not sure, you know, what we could have done differently or whether, you know, it's, it's. <laughs> well, I guess what I'm interested in is like we critique other mm -hmm. systems, and this has been a, almost a critical conference on the existing systems. Mm -hmm. I'm just trying to turn that same view back on ourselves yeah. mm -hmm. to see whether we made, you know, what assumptions did we bring that perhaps weren't the right ones. Mm -hmm. yeah. So the universal, that universality of problems, you can figure out that English is not my first language, so I think universality is the right word. Maybe not. Mm -hmm. Works yeah, for me. There you go. That's good. <laughs> Mike, any thoughts? Yeah, I, I might I might double down on, on Barbara's um, um, observation that I didn't quite see how uh, the tracks or themes uh, came together. And, and then weirdly, I also found that many of the better, many of the many good conversations uh, about collaboration were happening in an individualized learning. And, mm -hmm. and you know, many of the um, in the collaboration, there, there is, you know, talk about individualized learning. You know, so there was a, w there was a way in which, um, in some ways, there was more unity than you might expect. Uh, in other ways, they weren't, they didn't necessarily um, um, come together in, in ways that you expected. Okay. Question from the floor? Yeah, um, Rebe Rebecca Hoke here. Um, a quick, actually, more comment, and then I will be really quick, I'll tell you. Um, first of all, um, Feedback-wise, I think one thing I would have liked a little bit more of is a little more unstructured time because we were running from session to session to session um, and perhaps limiting people like me from only allowed to present maybe twice, not four times in the conference. Um, anyways, um, I want to put a call out to the people who aren't in the room in particular because um, there have been some great feedback uh, about the virtual conference um, from people on the Twitter stream, and I'm hearing really positive things, and so thank you. Um, for making an effort to make this a great virtual conference for the people that aren't here. And if you didn't Questions like it Questions for online? anybody from the floor? All right, so I'll redirect questions, and if you don't like my questions, then ask better ones. So <laughs> have, uh, <laughs> did we surface research that will help us become better agents in driving and fostering the social change that we think we all want to see happen? Did that happen at this conference? Somebody from the floor can answer too. There's very bright people in this room. We're just the smartest up here, but you guys are also pretty good. <laughs> I don't think there was much system level research presented. I may have missed it. Um, there were some very uh, interesting perspectives or projects on a relatively small scale with a particular course, for example. Um, but if we really want to address the higher education problem, uh, we do have to get to the point where we're working at a, a systems level. And I actually didn't hear a lot of conversations at the system uh, level, yet alone uh, research findings. I, I will say so one th oh, oh, sorry. This is a question. I will say one thing really positive about uh, this, this conference, which is, um, uh, you know, my experience of going to conferences over the past, you know, uh, you know, four or five years has been so much of it is individual people 
pitching their projects in this way that's just very uncritical. Yeah. Um, and, 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 you know, and, and you just, you're not, what you really want to know is you really want to know what, what went wrong, <laughs> you know, and, and what can we learn from what went wrong. And, and what I really l thought worked about this conference was this was a conference where people were completely unafraid of, of saying what was wrong, and, and we got to drop the, the evangelism of our, of our personal uh, of our personal projects, and I really appreciated that because I, I think it's long past time that we get, you know, especially ed tech, out of its uh, you know juvenile obsession uh, with with uh, this sort of rah rahism. Jennifer, thank you, George. Um, I think yeah, well, there were a lot of research ideas that came out of this conference. This is my first conference that's very tech driven like this. I've attended the first year experience um, out of South Carolina. I've attended a lot of trio conferences where it's more practitioner based. What is the best practices? And research is not informing those practices, not like here. And I would have to say I, I'm leaving with three research ideas. I'm leaving with a whole network of colleagues. Um, like I mentioned, this is my first conference. I've been inspired by a lot of the dialogue and the presentations that are here to where I hope to um, continue to add to these projects. Um, I think that it's important for the research that's done here to inform practice. And I'm seeing a slow shift on the federal level where now federal grants are being um, grounded in research and so I think the more research that can come out of here especially with digital learning and wanting to put it up on that platform I think that the research that you guys are doing here is going to just help be a catalyst for that. For sure. Thank you and we will I just want to emphasize we will get to the happy part I, I just uh, I think we, we can't sit here and pat ourselves on the back and say we're wonderful without first looking at what did we not do right so there is a happy part to my moderation. <laughs> <laughs> George you got a question? question? Yeah a question for you actually. Um, like, was your hope to, for the group, you know, to raise questions that could be researched, or was your hope for people to come and present, you know, their research papers or like use evidence in their, um, yeah. in their work? Well, I guess my hopes are largely irrelevant in that regard because we had an exceptional group of folks that were leading a conference. I just sort of sat there and did stuff and didn't answer email. But That's so true. as uh, you're aware, and, and it, it's well worth thanking. I should have done this at the start, but uh, so Kate Bowles was a real privilege. Uh, she's probably the best writer on the internet, and so um, you know, having being involved with her and having conversations, I had a crap. November, December, January, and I was whining to people. One of our calls, it was like, I think I was apologizing to Dave for like, I, you guys thought you were joining a conference that you were my freaking counseling committee. Anyway, um, so <laughs> having someone like Kate involved was outstanding. Having someone like Bonnie involved and, and then Kristen and then we had Dave, that sort of took some of the joy out of it. And then we had <laughs> Matt, we had Matt and Justin that were involved and so uh, you know, they were the people that made the things happen. So my hopes are irrelevant in this regard. But I think as a team, we were quite interested in really raising the profile of the dimensions that aren't heard in education, but to do so through a research lens. To lack of a better word, I wanted to find a pathway to be at the seat or the table of power. And the only thing I can think of is research. If somebody else has a better idea, I'll happily entertain that. But that's, that was the lens I had. Uh, you're next. Okay. I just had a, a comment to react to the, the not a lot of conversations around around systematic change and I've actually, f maybe it was just at the different experience but, and, and I think maybe that's pushing back on the assumption of like where does change place and how does change place and what do we mean by systematic change because I've been at a number of panels where to, you, to extend your, your metaphor of the little dog, <laughs> the little dog has fought and made systemic changes um, through ingenuity um, and just doggedness um, to get there. I mean, as the, uh, how many panels did I go to where it was, I was an adjunct and then moved into this role where I have some influence and I am using it in the community college system online, in faculty development, in even thinking of uh, something like a domain of one's own, which was not a top down they're, they're not top-down things. They were stuff that were created from um, George as well. Like yeah, just all, was, everything coming down from the bottom. I was thinking specifically about research on systems change. So okay. Research on systems change, as opposed to the need for systems change or individuals uh, changing a system by individual leadership. I, so that's the distinction. Oh, okay. Uh, so I, I don't think we really do. No, all right. I'm okay. sorry, I misunderstood. But I think it's, I think also, again, just maybe thinking about that as like where is change, change taking place and how are we affecting change um, in those kinds of ways? Because I think there, there have, there, 
one thing I take away is there have been a lot of um, really important success stories. See, you know, I'll pull it over to, to Dave here. I do want to make a small point, though, is that it's the stories part that's challenging to me. Because, and, but we, you know, we understand the world through, we communicate our understanding of the world through narrative. That doesn't necessarily mean we gain our understanding through narrative. Um, and so what I mean by that distinction is it's the research lens that, that shapes. Once we have enough research to create a narrative, it's the narrative that allows us to communicate it. That's my take. But you were going to say, sorry, I interrupted. Oh, I was just going to say, I, I think you could question the assumption that research is, or is the lever for change most available to us. I, I, don't, I don't know whether that's, I mean, Research is the lever that we're closest to, but whether that's the lever with the most potential to change the higher education system, I actually don't know. And if somebody wants to challenge that assumption, I, I I'd love it. But what I ask to you is, do you, do you see anything else within our control? Like it's not a general control. It's right. what can we do as right. a community that wants a humane, compassionate society with kind people and little dogs that don't have to fight. Yeah. What do we? What would we you'd be able to use rather well, than? Well, I, you know, I, I actually, and I, I really enjoyed a lot of the presentations about little dogs that not only did fight, but they were, you know, they were very open. They were in the social media about it. They were blogging about it, and it, it's not clear to me that um, a really good blogging <coughs> little dog or network of blogging little dogs wouldn't have more impact than a really good research study on systemic change. Uh, it's not clear to me which would be more powerful. Right. Thanks. Um, I'd just like to, to, to ask a question about the timing. I mean, when I think about the idea of preparing research papers to hurry up and rush the research in time to get it done before you come to a conference, it almost seems like a sort of print era mentality. And I wonder if what we're doing here is, is not looking at the timing of this in quite the right way. Jeffrey uh, in the back channel here is saying, you know, I think there are conferences where the first one is about establishing the questions and the second one's about answering them. Mm -hmm. and, and I just, I wonder if the sort of strict way of looking at the, oh, the research wasn't here at the conference may just be sort of a 1980s version, 1980s way of looking at it. Well, George? I, you're, oh, so that's a question. <laughs> so, so first of all, um, I think the research pipeline is amazing, and we need more of it, not less. I'm not comfortable with the timelines of research. If you have a novel idea and it takes you months and months and even years, in some cases, to get it published, that's a pretty shit system. But the let's do something, let's use a methodology to interpret how and what we did and what the outcome was. Let's share that in a public way that encourages feedback and criticism. I love that process. There's, I mean, go Francis Bacon, you know, that's the best thing you ever did for us is this, the process of a scientific method. What I found a little uncomfortable here, and not universally, like I, I just want us to criticize ourselves before we love ourselves. And so I don't think that there's anything wrong with research there might be something wrong with the process and the pathway that we're using it in, but beyond that, I don't think it's a 1980s approach to want empirically validated processes. Getting it ready for the conference so that this is the delivery mechanism of the finished research. Well, so there's another way we could have done it, potentially, and Kristen did suggest this as a potential approach, was treated as a design jam type of an event where you put your research online, people read it, you get together, you solve a problem with a group of super bright people. Just because I think about Marcia, so good, so good. Good, good. And I are probably going to go ahead and work on some of the stuff that she was talking about and some of the stuff that I was talking about and probably may end up doing research out of it in terms of how to make change in terms of that engagement stuff. I don't know. We haven't started that conversation yet. But I can't do the, we can't be the only two people who have that kind of conversation when we're here. That research will come. Okay. Yes. So I really appreciate what I think George is asking us to do because it's very practical. I'm a really, really practical person, even though I deal with theory. 
So one thing that I wanted to ask, because I think it's a great idea, if we want to change the system, who has the power? Let's go to research. Research has the power. What if, you historic, what if we historicize this question? Because we're not the first field, or people at this, at this table are not the first field to try to make digital pedagogy an important research question. I mean, RETCOM has done this since the 70s. There are other fields that have privileged digital pedagogy for the longest time. And I mean, Jesse Stommel also talks about this in the sense that he's always been talking about how digital pedagogy is not really taken seriously by the digital humanities because digital humanities is research, whereas digital pedagogy is teaching, right? So my question is like, and I wasn't here yesterday, but so but my question is like, how can we learn or how in the future, when you plan these discussions, how do, you, how do we learn from the lessons of the past in order to inform what you want to do today? That's a great question, um, and um, I'll, I'll throw my answer in there, uh, just because I um, am in instructional design, right? That field that has been around since 1945, talking about this thing and no one pays attention to, right? Because <laughs> It's not scientific in some ways, but the learning sciences that pretty much do the same thing, get all the funding, um, <laughs> you know, but maybe well, it's because... Well, you what to do now. Yeah, <laughs> so, You're you know, maybe, maybe it's because they have science in the name, maybe because they have figured out something different, but, um, you know, I think one of the things that we learned from instructional design and the lack of respect that it's received over the time is, you know, this mix around what the message so, so the unclarity of the message, right? Uh, you talk to 20 people about what they do as instructional designers and you'll get 15 different answers. Uh, Comments from either of you on the historical things we could learn from? Well, I, I guess, I guess I, I'm a little bit, um, I'm a little bit skeptical that research is going to be the lever. Um, but I, you know, I don't, I don't know. I just, I look at the things that are successful, and um, I, I guess I, I don't see them as. Not, and it's not only that they're not research; it's just they're not even particularly reflective. So, um, so I don't know. <laughs> so <can laughs> Is that cynical enough? <laughs> All right. So let's, let's just let's spend a little bit of time on this, and then then yeah, we're flipping yeah. the switch to happiness. Yeah. But. Um, it is actually. Right, right, right. <laughs> <laughs> then we're going to slide the scale over to happiness. <laughs> is there anything else you think from our end as, as folks in the field? What, I mean, there, we can yeah. do activism. Yeah. But activism, you can, once the rhetoric starts, the moment you use certain terms, they immediately get pushed to the side and ignored. Yeah. So, so can you think of anything else that might enable us? And I really, I am, I genuinely think we have to get our asses to the, seat, to the table of power. Yeah. If we want to shape an education system that has compassion for the individual and the generation of more equitable uh, societies, it's not going to happen if we let venture capitalists and startups drive. Yeah. Not that they're soulless, but they have different priorities and yeah. that's fine. Any other thing you think we could turn our attention to that would give us some <laughs> ability to influence that conversation? In, in a minute or less, or, I, you know, I, I actually, I, I don't know, I struggle with this, and that's partially why, why I, uh, you know, opened um, with no preparation, sorry folks, uh, but with the comment I did, which is that, uh, you know, I, I, there's a tension here because what I love about this conference is this is some, these are some of the most reflective, self-critical, people I've had that are willing to look at what we've been doing for the past 10 years, l willing to look at things they've evangelized, you know, over the past 10 years and, and radically reconsider them and, ra and think about what we've left out. And, um, and there's a part of me that's just so cynical that believes it's exactly that capacity <laughs> for critical self-reflection uh, that, y you know, that... Um, you know, kind of locks us out of all, all this stuff. And I'm not, it, it's not like, oh, well, we stop being reflective and instantly, you know, um, you know we'll, we'll have some sort of garage space, you know, uh, in Mountain View or something. Um, but, um, but, I mean, there, there's a, there is this tension. I, I just, I, just I, I, don't, I don't know what the other levers are. It's, it's just, it's been a really, it's, it's an interesting conference because to me it feels a bit, um, it feels a bit like a period, um, or you know, or some some sort of full stop, 
to what we've just been through, which has been really weird and surreal. And, and this feels like the end of that and a reassessment of that. And that's what, I, that's what I really like about this conference, but I don't know where we go when everything that was seen as momentum either you know, died or went off in horribly reductive, abusive <laughs> directions. You know? So like, what do you do at that point? And, and, um, and, and if, if research is it, um, that, would be, that would be lovely uh, because that would be great. All right, so, so oh, oh, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, I, I'm ready to move to my happy space, too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right, so, so we're going to make, we're going to, we're going to move <laughs> on the spectrum so that <laughs> Professor Stewart in the back. Anyway, so uh, oh, well, let's trans... I just wanted to say something about it. I think, I, I actually think there is, um, uh, there is a, a way to be an optimist about this. Uh, we're actually at a crisis point in public higher education. Uh, given the plummeting of state funding for public higher education. Well, yeah, <laughs> I was, I'll go there right away. As soon as she's done, we'll go there. The, the, the mission of serving a more diverse set of people and people who don't have the money to pay the current tuitions, the public college tuitions, yet alone um, the private tuitions, and given increased scrutiny um, by government agencies that are paying for scholarships, and this is U.S. centric, I'm sorry, but I, I think some of this applies across the world. Um, we now have institutions of higher education that know they're broken. They've got to do something. And I think that's where research actually can join with people who know they have a problem. And that problem really is around providing an education that people think is valuable enough that they're going to borrow money for it, that states think is valuable enough they'll give money to the university, and that they have a completion rate. They're not just letting people in, but they're finishing, fulfilling their goals, whatever those are. So I actually think they're more open to research that is tied to solving that problem than they ever have been before. But we have to be willing to meet them at the problems that they see and to be willing to negotiate our research focus with the pressures that they feel. And that requires some reorientation on our part, as well as some reorientation on their part to be more research driven. So that, that right, is the so happy part to me. So the transition then that I see in, in this regard is, first of all, we are aware that change is happening. And the best time to move a system in a direction is when it's already in transition. It's very hard to generate the momentum to make a system change. A system that is in the midst of change is much easier to navigate and guide and influence. And so what I'm extremely optimistic about is that we're now at a time educationally where there's a growing consciousness or growing awareness around there are assumptions embedded in our system that are going to create a future in the system in the f for our kids, for who knows who else, that's going to just suck, for lack of a better word. And you combine that with some of the focus on autonomous vehicles and autonomous technologies, and we're going to have major labor market upheaval. So my view is, what a wonderful time to be alive in helping to shape the education system that will probably exist for the next several hundred years after we're happily dead. So <laughs> this is where we are. And That's like, what so an incredibly <laughs> motivating opportunity we have. You know, the things that we do are going to shape generations going forward. The equity that we embed in the system is going to do that. So when I get a little depressed and miserable about where things are going, it's terribly motivating to be able to think about what we're doing is making a real difference in the lives of real people who might not have ac access to higher education right now, who might be from underrepresented population. We can use our networks, the technology at our disposal, research methods to bring that kind of substantial and dramatic change about. And that's not just a cheesy statement. There is a legitimate future of education that we're going to make people's lives miserable or happy based on the decisions that we make here. But I'll throw it out to the audience here. What are your thoughts? I mean, what are you optimistic about where we are that you would love to just communicate and then we'll have a group hug? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm optimistic that um, the daughter of a welder, me, 
um, sitting here right now, and I can say to all of you, you're the big dogs. I brought the whole big dog, little dog thing. It was my last presentation. Um, but I'm optimistic that uh, someone like me can sit here and tell you all that um, I think the solution is to get ahead of policymakers about technology. Imagine how things can go wrong with their initiatives. Look, at, in the American context, we have achieved the dream. Um, if you look at the research based on online education with Achieve the Dream, it's 2004. Dial-up era, right? So everything that is connected to what's happening with policy, with technology, um, use your imagination and your big dog status to imagine how things can go wrong and communicate that, whether it's at conferences or publishing, because I'm just a little dog on the internet. I'm that woman on the internet complaining. Um, and, and so there, there is power there. So in these discussions that I've had with people in other systems, right, Kate Bowles, the best writer on the internet, my friend. Um, and it's, so it's been a, a bit of magic. So um, I'm taking that away. And if you can publish that work and spread that word, that would mean a lot to a lot of little dogs. Let's hear from someone who hasn't had a chance to speak yet, just so we get some diverse voices in. What are you optimistic about? The back? Well, <laughs> further at the back. There's always someone behind you. I'm not so sure that this is an optimistic uh, remark, but let me put on my taxpayer hat. Why should I trust you? Over the last 20 years, the price of higher education has increased much faster than the price of health care. The number of faculty has risen slowly, uh, much less slowly than administrative staff. There are more adjuncts now than ever before. Higher education is less accessible in the U.S. than any other place. Uh, tell me why your research or whatever else you're talking about is going to help solve the crisis in higher education. The cost of higher education hasn't increased. The cost to the individual student has increased. There has been, by and large, if you incorporate the public reduction of funds, you're actually seeing a near zero increase. So basically, it's the public divestment from higher education that has raised the cost of it to an end user. You go to systems, and this is one of the things, so I guess one of my answers would be, if you're optimistic, go to China, go to India, go to any of the Scandinavian countries, go to Germany, because they have functioning education systems that contribute societally. In the U.S., there's a common... <laughs> There's a combination in the U.S. that is politically driven. There's a strong anti-tax sentiment that influences that kind of an architect. So you shouldn't trust me, but you should trust the numbers that say that where the line of public decline in education connects with the tuition increase. Second thing to be aware of, while administrative increase is an issue, part of the reason we've had administrative increases now is because we're educating up to 40 in the U.S., close to 40 plus percent of the population. Other parts of the world, like Israel and Canada, are approaching the 55 percent range. Those systems have to deal with a different population than they used to. When you have your 10 percent brightest members of society, they're going to do it regardless. When you're trying to bring everyone along, you have to have support structures. You have to have centers that address personal problems that individuals face and so on. So just from a quick perspective, I think that's part of the contribution to administrative bloat. President's making a million and a half a year. We all know what we think of that. It's terrific. But would, <laughs> would anyone else want to comment on, on that? So you're raising a good question. As a taxpayer, yeah. well, why I, should research matter? I'd, I'd say you know, what, what George said about, about the cost. Um, i say also my, to try the, to put in my, you know, I, in some ways I'm, I'm a person that can be happy to be miserable in a way, like if it feels like a really well-grounded misery. So, <laughs> so, um, so please don't interpret like I'm going and saying this is a hard. I, I'm actually, I'm so glad to be at a conference um, that says, you know, maybe we're doing things wrong, you know, and, and doesn't spend all the time talking about how everything we've done over the past 10 years is proving us right. So that's, that's wonderful. So that's the thing number one. Thing number two, though, uh, in response to the, the question, I think ultimately it comes down to a positive vision for, um, you, know, uh, you know, at least for, for me as, as, as the parent of a, of a traditional uh, student, a uh, traditional high schooler who will be going away, who's now looking at colleges. Um, if we if we can elaborate through connecting with these student stories of all varieties and all stripes, and envision the sort of education that inspires people, um, that that really that 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 is is just inspiring, you know, and it, it is it doesn't feel like uh, the factory unless you want the factory. Um, 
you know, I think that's, that's ultimately the tax, you know, taxpayers aren't just taxpayers, right? Taxpayers have many other roles and they revert to their role as taxpayers when the other parts of them as humans are not being spoken to. And so we, we need to speak to those other parts of taxpayers and be able to, I think, uh, make, that, um, make that case and have, and have a vision of something um, that, that inspires. And I, I, one of the really useful things we get here is by looking at the variety of student experience in particular, we get a better handle on what's not working there and, and, why, and why education is sometimes seen as, as oppressive or just a process of uh, going, through a, a going through the obstacle course to get the thing that lets you get the job. And, you know, I, I don't know. So I, I think that's, that my answer would be that if we speak to people as taxpayers, we lose, that we need to speak to the other parts of these individuals because that's, that's the only way uh, that, we, that we win. And I guess I would say I, I don't think you should trust us, actually. <laughs> I think you should make us um, give you some evidence. And to me, the, the big problem uh, that we see in higher education is that um, we, we have lots of opportunity for people to enter the system in a variety of ways. There are all kinds of institutions you can enter. But we're not, we're not getting people through the system with what they want. They're not able to complete the programs they had wanted to. Um, they're not able to get the degree or the credential they need in their lives. Um, they're leaving. We have like an open door. You go to a lot of our non-selective public colleges in particular, and it's just an open door. You look at the size of the senior class versus the freshman class. There's a reason why there are half as many seniors as there are freshmen. So there's a lot of waste. And if we, do, if we are inspired by our research ideas and our understanding, and we can be part of helping to design and evaluate programs that really make a difference on that, on that agenda on giving better value to students, there will be numbers to show you. And I think you should want to see those numbers. So, um, and as researchers, we should be open to that. Okay, so one more question from the floor before, or comment is fine, before we do a final minute with each panelist to wrap up. Anyone else have, Laura? Do you have a microphone in your hand? Do you think there's been enough divergent thought? Because I got concerned about hearing an echo chamber of things always, and it's not, it's just being critical, and I was thinking, like, who's not in the room? Like, I've not heard a policy person. I've not heard a workforce driven specifically studying in that field. Um, I've not heard some practitioners that aren't in the room that are support staff. So. And I think it's good that we've had these conversations, but what are we going to do past this point? We had this talk in the coffee line, as you usually do. It's Tim Hortons in Canada and Starbucks in the U.S. and awesome places everywhere else. Um, but we had these conversations about what are we going to do with this now? And it's not us that needs to drink the Kool-Aid. It's what about everyone else? That's my thought is have we really moved past what we already know? <laughs> Any comments before we go to the summary on that? I think it's a great point. Okay, so uh, let's just take, uh, we've got another, well, three minutes now. So you've got a minute each. We'll start with George. What do you want to share awesome. with us? Um, yeah, I mean, I echo what Laura was saying, but I also appreciate the diversity, right? I go to the ARA conference and I hear, you know, researchers talk about their study in, you know, like five little slides. And then I go to, you know, attack focus conferences, and it's a different conversation, but it's, you know, a very small group talking about the same things, and I think that um, the fact that you guys are able to bring together uh, this diverse of a group um, is to be congratulated, so I, mean, I, I really appreciate that, so I end with that positive note. Thanks, George. Barbara? Okay, yeah, I, I was inspired by Laura's comment, too. Um, I think one of the wonderful things about this conference was the perspective of being open and talking about what you're doing and not in a, you know, I have the greatest, shiniest technology ever, it all works for everybody kind of way. And we need to continue that kind of conversation, but bringing in people, um, say chief academic officers from colleges, having more of those people engaged with us in the conversation. I was at a um, National Research Council meeting, I guess it was a couple of years ago now, they had convened, it was called the Future of Higher Education, 
I didn't, I, I didn't know what it was or why I got invited. And I'm around the table, and there are presidents of university systems. And I'll have to tell you, and I had not read a lot about the economics of higher education until prep for that meeting when I started reading about the cost. And those people among each other were actually very candid. They were very candid about how freshman tuition was actually uh, subsidizing certain departments and how, uh, you know, and the uh, upper division courses are subsidized by the lower division course and the school of education is subsidizing this school and that school and this school. And as a taxpayer, my eyes were getting bigger and bigger. Um, but they know they're in crisis and they have to do something. So that's why I think if we bring them together with researchers, that some of them are going to be willing to, um, to collaborate. And I think that's the way to go. Right. Um, so, uh, you know, I... I Again, I, f I found this. I'm still. I'm going to be processing this conference for weeks, and and that's a good thing. Um, and I I think what I hope comes out of this is that I think along the lines of what Dave is saying that um, we've made new connections of people that maybe have admitted uh, they see th who see certain problems that we thought we were the only people seeing or talking about. Um, and, and I guess my great hope for the conference is that some of those connections end up in, in profitable uh, partnerships. There's, there's been just been so many moments uh, here where um, you know people in their their absolute uh, you know uh, people here uh, in, in in this critical enterprise uh, you know in with absolute candor have have expressed things that. Uh, you know, I've often I've often uh, thought, but they they had the research and they had the um, and they had the they had the background, and you know, I, I want to talk to those people more. So, so for me, the value of this conference is is still to to be determined. Great, thanks. I think for myself, and I often wonder, you know, why I'm in higher education, and then I realize it was because they hired me. But uh, I think a lot of us were quite passionate about making a better world. I mean, that's a core reason for why we're here. And so I'm looking, I, I think we're at the cusp of a new era of human creativity as we have more autonomous agents taking over the routine physical labor. We're at a point where being human, being creative is going to be you know, an area of just explosion and stimulation in that regard. I also think, and I really believe this, that if we're actively involved in this process, we're also going to enter a new era of compassion and kindness and care and concern for one another because of our global connectivity. And so I'm optimistic about those things, this explosion of human creativity and the advancement of compassion and kindness uh, and care and concern for one another. So that's what I hope as we sort of head out and reflect on some of the challenges, discussions that we've had here, that there's an optimistic and hopeful takeaway. I always find it fascinating when I talk about compassion and kindness and love and peace, that people almost have to throw out a dismissive claim that, yes, this is important, but, you know, I was like, you know, it's a, but just admit it, damn it, we all want a compassionate world that our kids like and that they can grow up in and, and then there's going to be love and care for one another. We all want that. So we might as well be direct about it and put our requests on the table. So I think that's an era that we're about to enter if we are focused, if we uh, take our seat at the table of power in through whatever means are available to us.